Okay, good morning, everyone. It's uh, day two of the Board of Governors, and uh, we're going to start by calling the roll. Hildegard B. Aguinaldo. Here. Darius W. Anderson. Here. Amy M. Costa. Tom Epstein. Here. Felicia Escobar Carrillo. Colin Fitzgerald. Here. Jolina M. Grande. Pamela Haynes. Here. Kevin J. Hall. Here. Kim Carrigo. Here. Jennifer L. Perry. Jennifer L. Perry. Here, present. Bill Rawlings. You're on mute, Bill. <laughs> Alma Salazar. Here. Valerie L. Shaw. Here. Glass of Okay, um, we have a quorum, so uh, we will begin. And as we mentioned, we're going to start with um, item 5.2, uh, a very uh, enjoyable and exciting uh, event, the uh, Classified Employee of the Year Awards. So I'll turn it over to the Chancellor. Thank you, Board President Epstein. Good morning to the members of the Board of Governors. It's a pleasure to be here again. And it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce the next uh, item on the agenda, the 2020 Classified Employee of the Year Awards. Um, it gives us, gives me and, and the entire team here in the Chancellor's Office great pleasure to be able to highlight some of the most outstanding members of the classified staff in our system and gives me an opportunity to just thank all the classified staff again for the amazing work that they uh, do in any typical year, but particularly this um, uh, very uh, stressful year. So um, thank you to all the classified staff, but today we get to honor uh, some of the more outstanding members of the classified staff. And to do that, uh, I want to introduce one of my favorite classified staff members, uh, board member Bill Rawlings. I'll turn it over to you, Bill. Bill, your, your volume's a little low. It's a little low? Let's, how about now? Need more. Need more? Let's see. I gotta, I gotta adjust my mic. How about now? That's better. Better? better? Okay. Uh, maybe even a little more if you can. Let's see. Choo -choo. Here we go. How about this? That's good. All right. Uh, thank you, Chancellor Oakley. Uh, as you would expect, this is one of my favorite uh, items each year that we present, uh, but it is especially significant this year, as the Chancellor mentioned. Um, it's really during challenging times like these that the, the work of classified employees really shine. And whether it's uh, partnering with our faculty to translate the deeper learning of a STEM lab into an online environment, or it's uh, distributing food to students who weren't sure where their next meal was going to come from, or if it's uh, taking a few extra mo moments out of uh, distributing uh, mobile internet hotspots uh, to, to take those extra few minutes to speak with an older student who uh, really probably hasn't socialized outside the home in weeks or months. Um, your work is extraordinary and it's essential to the, success, to the success of our mission. And I'm proud to be one of you. Uh, this year's winners are uh, wonderful examples of classified who are committed to the vision for success. And with that, I am proud to pre uh, present uh, first, uh, Amy Ethington from Santa Rosa Junior College. Congratulations. Uh, Amy has served the district 
uh, as a direct line to Santa Rosa Junior College students for over seven years as the CalWORKs student advisor. Amy's role is critical in supporting student success. As the CalWORKs student advisor, she works with students that have children under the age of 18 who are working to build supportive and caring families with informed parents and emotionally strong and healthy children. Amy pioneered Santa Rosa Junior College's first attempt to serve CalWORKs students at the county offices to provide one-stop services for students. She also participated in the Jails to Jobs training on how to serve formerly incarcerated students. Amy is pursuing her associate's degree in Spanish to directly serve and support Spanish-speaking students within the Santa Rosa Junior College community. She remains an active participant in the community. She serves her volunteer serves through her volunteer work and actively engages in shared governance as a member of the Classified Senate. Amy Ethington is a classified professional who demonstrates compassion, commitment, and joy through her work with students at Santa Rosa Junior College, along with the greater Sonoma County community. Thank you, Bill. Good morning, President Epstein, Vice President Haynes, members of the Board of Governors and Chancellor Oakley. I want to express my gratitude for the honor of being classified Employee of the Year and congratulations to my fellow award recipients. I also want to thank my Santa Rosa Junior College community, Board President Burns and members of the Board of Trustees, our College Superintendent President Dr. Chong, and Assistant Superintendent Vice President of Student Services Pedro Avila. Thank you also to Interim Vice President Human Resources, Sarah Hopkins for the support in the nomination process. Thank you to my colleagues in CalWORKs and EOPS. And thank you to the strong support of my husband and my three kids that give me strength to support other families in need. SRJC is a place that I feel very proud to be a part of. And I feel even luckier to be in service of our students. I get to witness vulnerability, grit, and transformation every day. Dolores, uh, one of my students, is a perfect example of this. I met Dolores back in 2006. She had three felony charges, including drug possession with intent to sell. She also had aspirations of becoming a nurse. However, she hadn't been in school in over 20 years. And during that time that we worked together, Dolores held down two jobs, expunged her record, earned a 4.0 grade point average, all while single parenting a 17 year old and a toddler. Today, she is a nurse, bought her first home and loves her career. Dolores is one of the many reasons I love my career. Compassion, commitment, and joy. This is me, and I am SRJC. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Next, we have uh, Brian Horwitz from Kenyatta College. Uh, Brian has worked uh, at Kenyatta College for 23 years as the bookstore operations assistant, and I can bet that job's changed over time. Uh, Brian's colleagues describe, his, describe him as an embodiment of the student's first philosophy coined by the San Mateo Community College District. As the first recipient of the SMC CCD Board of Trustees Above and Beyond Award, Brian was recognized for going above and beyond to send academic materials to a soldier in Iraq who was not a student at the college, but in need of finding someone to help him. In his current role, Brian supported the bookstore efforts to create a textbook rental program. The textbook rental program became a model for bookstores across the country and allowed students to rent textbooks for a fraction of the retail cost. As a means to combat food insecurity, Brian was instrumental in the development and rollout of the Brown Bag Program. As a member of CSEA, Brian was, has been uh, involved in supporting his fellow employees by providing, by providing counsel to staff and union leaders. Brian has served as a selfless, encouraging, and supportive classified employee at Kenyatta College. Congratulations. Okay. Okay. I, hi, I'm Brian Horowitz. I'd like to thank Chancellor Oakley, President Epstein, and each member of the Board of Governors for honoring me 
as one of the classified employees of the year. I could not be more grateful. I would also like to thank Christina Castro for all of her hard work in putting this together and congratulate each of the other award winners. My 23 plus years working with the San Mateo Community College District were an absolute joy. To me, this award is an acknowledgement of my extended bookstore family, our amazingly talented students, and all of the accomplished employees within our district. Special recognition goes out to Tom Bauer and Jay Kumar, as through their selfless leadership, the Kenyatta Bookstore has become an entity focused on finding solutions to the challenges our students face. The textbook rental and brown bag meal programs, which both received our Board of Trustees above and beyond awards are wonderful examples of this. The unwavering support I've received on the Kenyatta College campus and throughout the district is touching. That along with the unconditional love and support from my family and friends remind me on a daily basis of just how lucky I am. Finally, there is someone I would like to dedicate this award to, someone who has instilled within me the empathy, compassion, and strength needed to constantly re reach out and do my best each and every day. She is my best friend and love of my life, my wife of 43 years, Linda Horwitz. Thank you again for honoring me with this incredible award. Thank you, Brian. Next, we have Aaron Turner of Long Beach City College. Aaron is an embodiment of Long Beach City College's mission to provide support services to diverse communities and put students first. Aaron encourages those, encourages those around him to always keep a positive attitude. His coworkers see him as the go-to person on campus. As a member of the Long Beach City College Classified Senate, Aaron has served on several committees, like the Faculty and Staff Diversity Committee and the District's Equal Employment Opportunity Advisory Committee to contribute to the campus community and student success. Aaron's leadership goes well beyond the Long Beach City College campus. He was integral in starting an African-American fathers group in Long Beach. As a member of the group, he builds relationships with youth and young adults in an effort to keep them on track, ensuring that they stay in school, further their education, and work toward a positive, rewarding future. On weekends, Aaron has dedicated his time to cleaning up his neighborhood and alleyways, which contributes to the sense of community and pride and safety. Congratulations, Aaron. Can you guys hear me? Okay. We got you. Okay. I'd like to uh, thank Chancellor Oakley, uh, President Epstein, and Christina Castro for nominating me. Um, I am honored and very grateful to the many that were instrumental in selecting me as the Classified Employee of the Year. I am truly fortunate to have such a wonderful team and leadership throughout the Long Beach City College community, showing their support in such a magnificent way. Since I'm at a loss for words, it might be best to simply express my appreciation with a sincere and profound thank you. Thank you, Cheryl Williams, my operations manager, and the Board of Governors. Uh, I'd like to thank Jean Durant, Vice President of HR, and the whole Long Beach City College family. I will forever treasure this award. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Sandra Mills from Los Medanos College. As a graduate of Los Medanos College, Sandra Mills' roots run deep with over 20 years of service. She began her career as a student tutor in English and now serves as a senior coordinator of the Center for Academic Support. In her current role, Sandra has been critical in implementing AB 705 with wraparound supports for students by working collaboratively with faculty, student tutors, and deans while holistically supporting student excellence. 
Sandra actively participates as a leader at Los Medanos as a member of the Classified Senate and founding member of the Los Medanos annual Classified Senate Holiday Luncheon, which raises money for student scholarships and brings the entire campus together. In response to the Real College survey, Sandra brought, brought forth the idea of implementing the Brain Food with Ease project at Los Medanos College. The program embeds equity-minded practices into tutoring curriculum while introducing healthy food into the learning environment. Sandra proudly promotes Los Bananos College beyond the campus while working her second job at Concord Pavilion, where she promotes pathways to college by wearing her college gear to community cleanups. Congratulations, Sandra. Thank you very much for that. Um, I would like to thank President Epstein, the board members and Chancellor Oakley for this wonderful honor. I am truly honored to be joining the classified professionals are receiving this award this year and also in prior years. I know they work very hard at their workplaces and so I am absolutely blown away to be receiving this award with so many wonderful classified staff throughout our state. Um, I of course would like to thank the Contra Costa Community College District and interim Chancellor Jean Hoff who have honored me at the district level as well and given me the opportunity to receive this award today. Also very proud and honored that Dean Sabrina Quist provided such an excellent nomination package. I haven't been able to read it, but I understand it was excellent. I'd love to see it one day. Um, and of course, my colleague, Nicole Almasy, who I know played a pivotal role in this as well. I'm very fortunate to be receiving such a wonderful award to work at a college, Las Madonnas College, that is a wonderful place that supports students and all of the professional, classified professionals go above and beyond to support students and make sure they are successful in their college careers. Like Erin, I'm um, at a loss for words that I'm receiving such a one award. I work with a myriad of colleagues who go beyond their daily work days, especially now during COVID, to make sure students are successful and do what they can support. In my honest opinion, I feel that probably every, every one of my colleagues at Los Madonnas College deserve this award. So I am also taking this award for all of the wonderful classified professionals that work at Las Madonnas College. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sandra. And uh, remember, we'll have nomination forms open uh, next year so you can nominate some of your coworkers there. I, I know how, how many uh, classified across the state uh, really are deserving and, and haven't been recognized yet. So there's plenty of time. Next, we have uh, Melody Cronister from Imperial Valley College. Melody serves as a leader and statewide subject matter expert in several initiatives and projects regarding technology, technology training, and participatory governance at Imperial Valley College. She has over 12 years of experience in CCC My Path, DegreeWorks, Starfish, Canvas, and many other programs to ensure the success of students across the state. Melody has been called upon to assist districts with leveraging technology, but also helps to bridge the gap at Imperial Valley College by helping faculty and staff understand the latest technology and use of software to lead more efficient and improved processes and a more accurate account of data. In addition to her duties as a business analyst, Melody serves on several committees within her campus and regularly attends conferences and workshops related to online education and higher education software applications. Melody represents the best of Imperial Valley College both on and off campus. Congratulations. Thank you, President Epstein, Chancellor Oakley, distinguished board and fellow classified nominees. I am humbly honored to receive this recognition along with you. I also wanna recognize my mother who's a classified employee that retired this year after almost 20 years with Palomar College. Uh, Cause she was part of the reason I'm here today. I am a product of the CCC system attending four CCC colleges in three different districts, um, partially using distance learning before it was popular or mandatory, as it is right now. 
I would not be here today if it were not for the affordability and flexibility of the CCC system. I could not also have achieved these goals without the incredible support by our administration at IVC. There's so many I could recognize. They've all been amazing leaders supporting me, encouraging me and all of my ideas that I come to them with and uh, empowering me to reach for the stars and my awesome classified team members who are there working alongside with me to accomplish a unified goal, which is achieving student success through effective use of technology. I look forward to what the future holds with IVC, the uh, California Community College System, and beyond as we work together to face the existing challenges and rise above them. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Roxanne Noble from San Joaquin Delta College. Roxanne is knowledgeable in all areas related to athletics with over 26 years of service in the athletics department at San Joaquin Delta College. Roxanne is involved in every step of the process for Delta student athletes from onboarding to graduation and transfer. As the game manager for all home events, Roxanne oversees 100 events a year to ensure each event is properly staffed. To create cohesive daily operations of the athletics department, Roxanne works with the facilities, admissions and records, and transportation departments. She was instrumental in establishing the first ever athletic department sponsorship program, Community Through Unity. The goal of the program was to establish a partnership with local community groups and businesses. Roxanne assisted in making contact with local businesses and helped the athletic director establish the framework for the program. Roxanne has been the constant in the athletic department and continues to uphold high standards for the department. Congratulations, Roxanne. Good morning. I'd like to thank the board for selecting me as classified employee of the year. I feel honored to be representing San Joaquin Delta College, especially with board member Fitzgerald, who's a former student athlete at Delta College. I would like to give a special thank you to our athletic director, Tony Espinoza, for his nomination and his continued support and recognition of classified staff. You know, athletics is, not a, is a lifestyle. It's not a job, just a job. There are always new challenges and many, many celebrations. And to be surrounded by the most gifted coaches and student athletes has allowed me to truly enjoy being a part of this highly successful program for over 20 years. I want to give many thanks to my coworkers, the athletic trainers, the equipment manager, and the resource specialists. I couldn't do what I do without you. And finally, to our student athletes, our very talented and hardworking students who make coming to work every day fun and interesting. I can't wait to see all of you soon. Thank you. So, uh, thank you all. Um, a really uh, exciting, diverse uh, group with all different uh, parts of the state and all different parts of what classified employees do. It's, uh, it's really wonderful to hear these stories and congratulations to everyone. I'm, I'm gonna call an audible here for a second. Um, typically we do photographs of, um, of all of the uh, winners with, uh, with the uh, members of the Board of Governors or some, uh, some of the leadership and Bill and the Chancellor. and um, and we aren't able to do that today, obviously, but I'm, I'm going to see if, I don't know if this is possible, but can we uh, lose the PowerPoint, put everybody's photo up there and take a <laughs> picture of the Zoom board and, um, and, and uh, somebody can grab an image of this and everybody do a thumbs up and, uh, and we'll uh, send it to all the winners. Have we grabbed it? Or is, is somebody in the chancellor's technical office able to do this? <laughs> I don't know, hopefully. All right, well, we'll try to make that happen. Okay, thanks everyone. Tom, that audible is as professional as Peyton Manning would have done. <laughs> I hope it worked. Uh, 
Okay, so uh, we now do have a public comment period open. Uh, are there any public comments uh, about the classified employees of the year? Yeah, the public comment period for item 5.2 is now open. Please submit your comments through the Q&A feature of the Zoom platform and include the item number in your submission. Um, you can either identify yourself or specify that you would like to remain anonymous in your comments, and it will then be read out loud by a Chancellor's Office staff member. I have received one comment so far through the Q&A here, and I will read it now. Congratulations to all the winners, classified professionals, yeah. And that is, those are all the comments we have at this time. I have not received any comment via email at this time. Okay, um, so uh, I guess that's it. Thank you uh, for all of the winners, for all your hard work, keep it up. Um, thank you, Bill, for uh, your big role in this, and Christina, who obviously uh, made this all happen as well. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you on the road after this is all over. Okay, moving on to uh, Item 5.1, uh, the total cost of college and college affordability spotlight. Good, mor good morning, members of the board, and good morning, member, uh, board member and board president um, Tom Epstein. My name is Lizette Navarrete, and I am the Vice Chancellor for College Finance and Facilities Planning. Um, and I have the honor of working with um, my colleague, Executive Vice Chancellor Marty Alvarado, to present this two part item. With that, I will jump in. Uh, I'm Marty Alvarado, Executive Vice Chancellor for Educational Services. Um, we want to thank the board uh, for maintaining total cost of college and college affordability as a key priority. Uh, we bring this uh, item at your request uh, to highlight some of the work that has been happening around reducing the cost of college and supporting students uh, with their financial needs, both basic needs and financial aid. Um, what we're bringing to you today is the first of a two-part series. Uh, uh, today, we will focus on um, what is currently happening across our system and the progress that we're making around uh, supporting the total cost of college as well, um, and then in the second part, excuse me, we will um, bring to you a more cohesive plan for uh, how we are bringing together all of these efforts to maximize impact for students, again, um, at the request of this board. Um, specifically, this segment provides updates on our current activities uh, that support total cost of college and college affordability. It provides updates on the recommendations from the affordability food and housing uh, access task force. Um, and then we are excited to bring to you a vision spotlight featuring Imperial Valley College and their multi-prong approach to how they are directly supporting students' needs. Um, with that, I will hand it over to my colleague, uh, Vice Chancellor Navarrete, to jump in. Great. Thank you, Executive Vice Chancellor Alvarado. Um, as you know, the Vision for Success calls for eliminating um, achievement gaps with this distinct focus on serving those that the state has not served equitably. Um, we're honored to present this item and really wanna thank uh, board member Costa, board member per Perigo, and also board member Shaw for um, reminding us of how important this work is and ensuring that we continue to do everything that is possible, even in light of this pandemic. So thank you for your leadership and, and for the leadership of the board. Uh, so we'll start with first the total cost of attendance um, on the uh, on the next slide. The total cost of attendance is defined um, in federal code um, to include comprehensive pieces. The work that the board has done has really focused on covering this total cost, including housing, food, um, and really dispelling the notion that tuition bears the largest expense for students. Next slide, please. As you can see in this example of uh, the cost that students have to uh, bear in order to attend college, you'll see that the majority is really included in uh, housing and room. Um, but we also see that other large expenses include personal and miscellaneous, which can include access to learning technology, critical, especially in light of distance learning protocols that we have during this pandemic. 
And then you see the small portion, um, uh, the smaller portion, which is included in tuition uh, for nearly $20,000 of costs for our students. Next slide, please. Here you can see uh, from the great work that our partners at the Institute for College Access and Success that community colleges often bear a higher net price for students compared to other uh, attending some, uh, institutions such as the uh, California State University or the University of California. And in nine of the regions, community colleges were actually higher net price than um, the community college in that same region. Next slide, please. And so uh, the Board of Governors um, really wanted to further analyze this by building momentum and by taking a data-driven approach and get an understanding of what the costs that students were bearing. And so um, the work led to a statewide survey that um, would highlight what students are costs are. 57 community colleges statewide participated with a response of from 40,000 students. And what this did is it um, indicated that um, students um, are really um, facing a much higher and more substantial gaps in their financial aid, um, as you can see, bearing a direct impact on their basic needs. Next slide, please. Of the respondents, the 40,000 students, 50% stated that food insecurity was an issue for them in the last uh, 30 days. And 60% of respondents um, indicated that they had been housing insecure in the last 12 months. And then 19% uh, of students indicated that they were homeless in the prior year. Next slide, please. And so what we're seeing is that California community colleges serve more low-income students than any um, other segment of higher education. Yet uh, community college financial aid or financial aid in general is not keeping up with their cost. Um, and that's because while half of community college students have their tuition waived, few qualify for financial aid to cover their living expenses such as transportation and learning technology. And so uh, the Board of Governors has taken bold steps in order to change and shift this policy to demonstrate uh, that, um, that more needs to be done to focus on financial aid. Next slide, please. So here I'll turn it back over to my colleague, uh, Executive Vice Chancellor Alvarado to share more of what we've done to shift this focus. Thank you. Um, so with this slide, we want to highlight how we've, uh, as Vice Chancellor Nevera indicated, shifted the focus to really highlight the true cost of college. A few elements of this include uh, making explicit that the cost of living in California uh, actually impact significantly the student experience and the limits of financial aid available to our community college students. It just doesn't go far enough to cover the comprehensive cost for our students. Uh, and this varies by region. Uh, the Board of Governors also sponsored uh, Senate Bill SB 291 in partnership with uh, Senator Connie Leva. Um, and this was really focused on trying to expand financial aid to address these inequities in our current system. Uh, really trying to make a, a meaningful shift to increase access for our community college students and really focusing resources on our most vulnerable Californians. Um, this bill uh, successfully elevated the policy discussion, although we still have more work to do uh, in this area. Uh, it focused on the total cost of college, as my colleague pointed out, not just the tuition. Um, really um, emphasizing the impact of room and board, transportation and textbooks, other areas that are, um, you know, what uh, are promised or are previously Board of Governors fee waiver, what, what, uh, what students are missing out on when we really only think about financial aid as the tuition cost. Next slide, please. Uh, our office really focused on, uh, in partnership with our student trustees and a number of advocates, um, focused on trying to get the word out, changing the narrative, um, really highlighting the disproportionate impact for our student population uh, and what that means for completion and progress 
Uh, and then the long-term economic impact of our students not being able to complete their education and uh, obtain employment in the workforce uh, at self-sustaining livable wages. So enjoying these pictures here, uh, mm -hmm. remembering when we used to be able to uh, convene all together. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the principle for our approach to the Community College Student-Centered uh, Financial Aid Reforms was really to uh, focus on student awards based on comprehensive financial need. And so we are working hard to ensure that we are clear about the comprehensive financial need, not just the tuition needs. Um, really trying to focus on a reduction of barriers, whether that's relative to age or GPA requirements, recognizing that a majority of our community college students are returning adults and those age barriers really limit access uh, to financial assistance. Um, and then really trying to create an approach that is inclusive of high quality certificates and associate degree programs that our colleges offer. Um, the types of programs that are eligible for financial aid create substantial barriers for those students that can access aid. Uh, and, and it really marginalizes, again, some of our highest need, most vulnerable populations. Next slide, please. Uh, a few things that we have been doing to reduce college costs, uh, trying to make progress where we have uh, the ability to, is around uh, these three categories, food assistance, rapid rehousing, and textbook costs. Textbook costs. Excuse me. Um, in food assistance, uh, there's been a major focus on in, uh, building connections and ensuring students have access to information around CalFresh, uh, a state uh, na a national but state benefit uh, around food stamps and access to uh, more food resources. Um, and then a majority of our campuses and now every college uh, will have an on-campus food pantry and or food food, uh, regular food distribution program. Um, as folks have seen, that is a also a new requirement of the C program, Student uh, Equity and Achievement Program, and the majority of our colleges already have really robust partnerships, if not uh, full on-campus uh, food distribution program. So we are um, uh, happy to see that we will continue uh, many of these partnerships and emphasize this uh, priority. Uh, we also, uh, in March, distributed 14 uh, awards to, or excuse me, uh, yeah, 14 grant awards to colleges uh, to support rapid rehousing. Um, this really is about building uh, sustainable infrastructure at campuses to support um, our housing insecure students. Um, we are excited. This is a $9 million allocation, and we are excited to continue to follow the progress of these 14 campuses. I think it's important to note here that this is. Um, one-time funding for these institutions and the sustainability piece is really important. Uh, so leveraging these uh, seed dollars, these seed resources to really build the, the, the capacity that institutions need to fully support institutions and uh, support students, excuse me. Um, lastly, in uh, 1819, we received about $6 million in one-time funds to expand our textbook costs textbook costs. Um, this is an area um, where uh, we've seen a lot of uh, progress uh, across our campuses. Uh, a big thank you to our academic senate colleagues, uh, library colleagues, and others who have really tried to uh, think creatively and proactively around how we reduce textbook costs for students, um, recognizing that it's not just a, a barrier um, you know, a cost barrier, but it's actually a progress barrier. When students don't have access to the instructional materials, they are more likely to drop out, they are more likely to fall behind, uh, which uh, substantially impacts uh, their progress. Uh, next slide, please. So here we want to share With um, the next, some of the uh, emerging strategies that um, that we've seen across the state and also um, efforts to shift policies to better focus on affordability. And then we'll also have the honor of highlighting a vision spotlight of Imperial Valley College. Next slide, please. And so um, in 2018, um, leaders from uh, campuses formed the Affordability Food and Housing Access Task Force to also focus on um, ideas that can um, better address basic needs and security. The task force was led and co-chaired by uh, Keith Curry, president and CEO of Compton College, and um, President um, Pam Luster, president of San Diego Mesa 
College, who is also uh, the president and chair of the CEO board this year. Known um, to many of you as the Equity Avengers, they've really focused on shifting affordability as a major equity issue. Last year, uh, the task force partnered with the Chancellor's Office and the Associate Association of uh, Chief Business Officials to really focus on phase two of their work. Phase two of their work had focused, phase one had focused on food access and phase two was more complicated as we were looking at um, ways to expand access to affordable student housing um, and policies that could lead and leverage partnerships for housing. Next slide, please. The task force ultimately came up with 12 recommendations for leaders across the state at colleges to consider and also for the Board of Governors to consider. Um, much of the work um, is underway to analyze um, both the impact, long-term implications, and ways to also infuse professional development in serving uh, community college students affordability. Next slide. So here you'll see the uh, 12 recommendations. We won't go into a lot of depth, but um, have included those in the written item um, and know that this uh, task force, again, led by um, uh, President Curry and President Lester continues as they explore ways to um, include these practices and these uh, recommendations and bring them to fruition across campuses in the state. Next slide, please. And so now we get to one of very exciting um, part of this presentation, this two part presentation, where we get to hear from leaders on how they're operationalizing uh, these practices and how they are advancing institutional strategies so that basic needs is not a barrier to completion. Um, and I have the honor of introducing uh, a a fierce leader across our campuses that continues to prove herself um, dedicated to her students and her community um, and innovating in many ways uh, through a student-centered focus and lens. Um, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Marta Garcia, president of Imperial Valley College. Good morning. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's an honor to be presenting what we are doing here at Imperial Valley College. Uh, thank you, President Epstein, um, Vice President Haynes, board members, Chancellor Oakley, and Chancellor's Office team. So I will start by conveying that we have 200 self-identified homeless students. What is significant when I share these stats you are aware of them, um, however, with the community, is that the majority of these students are under uh, the age of 25. Usually when the community thinks about uh, uh, our homeless population, they think about who they see on the streets. And many times our students, uh, you would not be able to identify that they're living in the circumstances that they're living under. and. What's most significant is that they are persevering, they're resilient, and their success rates are higher than house students. They're typically living in uninhabitable inhabitable environments such as couch surfing, uh, doubled up, or in um, homes, apartments where there's a few families living um, in, in the same location. Next slide, please. So our proposal, and really this is my dream, my dream to serve our most vulnerable students and do what is right for them, is to create a community with purpose, to create a pilot tiny um, living community that will not, initially our plan was to house 56 students. We will start with housing less students and I'll, I'll share uh, more of that reasoning. And we're aiming to create a resilient, tiny home living community um, that would house students for about two years. Next slide. This is a schematic that was developed by one of our local architects. Uh, we have identified a location in the city of El Central. The location is four and a half miles from the college. The students could utilize bikes to 
if they're able to, to ride to the college or uh, utilize public transportation if they don't have um, a vehicle or are not able to utilize bikes. Um, the, the commitment from uh, the Transportation Commission is to place a bus stop right in front of it. And this location is, is great because there are stores within walking distance from the location. So our goal is to create Lotus Living Rising Above community. Next slide. And one of the major focuses will be that they'll have a community center. I have commitments from different community members who will not only provide uh, workshops, uh, but also provide computers that would be located in this uh, community center would provide um, they we've actually had uh, donations of bikes already for students. So this is a community investment. It's not it is my commitment, my dream to my students, but reality when I continue conveying the dream the community realizes the important in making this investment. And there, as featured, there will be uh, community shared spaces. I've had volunteers to um, state and commit that they'll work on the actual uh, gardening and, and planting grass and so forth. Next slide. Um, this slide shows you the schematic of um, the actual tiny living home. What I want to share with you all, after going through what we're going through in Imperial County in relation to COVID-19, I have reconsidered that there will not be four occupants to a tiny home anymore. Frankly, it, will, it would not be safe um, at the most. It will be two unless um, the, we do have students with families, and I do not plan to um, to separate families. That that's that would be that is not who we are. That is not our intention. Um, that is the reason why we're fundraising mostly private dollars to to be able to house the students with their mother or with their children if needed. Next slide. I would like to. Uh, convey that Imperial Valley College and all colleges, we serve our communities in ways that we have never imagined, especially during these, these very difficult times. IVC is currently, um, has converted their gymnasium to operate, operate a federal medical station, which is uh, known as the Alternate Care Center. And initially, they started with the capacity of serving 80 COVID um, patients and um, low risk. We have now transitioned because of the dire needs in this community to potentially um, serve up to 120 and now moderate risk not low risk, moderate risk patients. I could tell you that as a, as a president, I never in my life imagined that we would be experiencing what we are and then be um, really a, we are a hope, we represent hope as, as a college, but now even more so to the community, hope to have the ability to receive local medical care these two hospitals located in Imperial County have transferred over 500 COVID-19 patients to hospitals as far as Northern California. So with upgrading the federal medical station, they will reduce the number of transfers and hopefully reduce uh, the number of lives that are being lost. Um, it is a very difficult situation. However, as I stated, I'm privileged that the college is able to serve the community in this manner. We have provided emergency grants and scholarships to, to, to students, both through the foundation and through our uh, private um, foundation uh, donations that we've uh, received. I do want to share very briefly that the city of Nyland, which is located in Imperial County, had a significant fire where 25% of the community members lost their homes. 
And of those 25%, which is uh, about 122, four of them were our students through these grants, we were able to support those students immediately. Um, and to be going through COVID-19 and to see that city, which is one of our poorest cities, go through that uh, tragedy has just been very difficult. We continue to provide uh, food, dis food distribution to our students. Prior to COVID-19, we were serving 2,400 a month. Um, since March 2019, we have served 1,148. Today, we have a food distribution going on. But what I want to share with you, what's most significant and represents the commitment that we have, that my team members have to these students, is that we're delivering food especially to the city of Nyland and Westmoreland, which are our most rural communities, and to COVID-19 impacted students because they were not able to obtain food any other way. There is no contact, obviously, and we're adhering to all uh, practices that, that enhance safety for our team members. This is being done by IBC employees who volunteer, and it's a significant contribution to our students that are in dire need. Um, I will uh, also share that we have, um, we have, as you have noticed and are aware, um, we have noticed that our, the mental and psychological well-being of our students and employees as well has been impacted by this situation. So uh, we recognize that and we have um, our mental health um, counselors provide some um, workshops by Assume to support our students and employees. It is very important as we create these transition plans that we recognize that there is a greater need to serve and provide services in relation to mental uh, health and well-being. And we have provided laptops and Wi-Fi hotspots to students and continue to do that. Um, but I want to end with one, one quote from a student um, and, and, and by sharing with you that we conducted a survey um, and it was surprising to um, find out that what students needed the most, what they need the most, 69% of the respondents said that they need food, they need hygiene items, and followed by student supplies. So there was an assumption that laptops, access to Wi-Fi would be at the top. And it's not, it's food. And it just like hurts my heart to know that there is so much need, a basic need, and yet um, students see the, this as their greatest need. So I'm gonna end with a quote that was provided during that survey from one of our students. Yes, I need all the help I can get, mostly food and hygiene items. I am a student and was working, but I'm COVID-19 positive. Also, if I could have it delivered to my doorstep since I'm quarantined and can't go outside, all the help would be a blessing to my family and me. Thank you. Great, next slide, please. So I wanna thank um, Dr. Marta Garcia for her leadership and the leadership of her team at Imperial Valley College and everything that they're doing to um, not only prioritize total cost of attendance um, and really start thinking and innovating about the next steps. And so um, we end with um, also a discussion that of our next steps um, and that really is to create a roadmap. What we've presented to you is what we've done, what we've identified through data. And now um, our role is to create a strategic roadmap to address basic needs and security and increase uh, financial aid access across all of our campuses so that um, every student can feel supported um, and continue their educational goals and plans. And so at a future meeting, we will bring to you um, a, a draft strategic roadmap on how we will continue to work with colleges. And with that, um, I wanna thank again, uh, Dr. Marta Garcia, 
um, and my co-presenter, Executive Vice Chancellor Marty Alvarado. Um, and I'll turn it over um, back to you, President um, Epstein. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, President Garcia, for that uh, moving presentation. And uh, so we'll now um, uh, look for board comments and questions. I'd like to make a comment, Tom. This is Kim. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for the presentation very much. I know uh, board member Costa and I asked if we could get a comprehensive look of kind of what's going on. And, you know, I work with one of the equity Avengers. I work with Pamela Lester um, every day and she's a great champion in all these areas. So I feel like I'm, I'm privy to a lot of this information that maybe others are not. So I appreciate you elevating this because I think it's incumbent on all of us to know this information and uh, I would encourage my fellow board members to go back through this presentation and make sure they're very familiar with what's going on here because unless we're all talking about it and elevating it, then it just does become this sort of here's a grant, here's a grant, here's a grant. And at some point, if we can't make this sustainable and if we can't institutionalize these things, then we're kind of just chasing our own tails all the time and we're not really helping our students. So I think that the key is to really understand the issues, to elevate the policy discussion, to make sure that whatever we're advocating for is sustainable, institutionalizable. And then I also want, um, and, and you kind of touched on this, and I, I think it's also very important there is um there's sort of an educational piece to this and there's a humanitarian piece to this that intersect and i want to make sure that we're not assuming that these are the barriers for students if we're going to stay focused on reducing equity gaps then this is a piece of it but that we have to be mindful that it's probably not the only piece so i'm going to be really um hopeful that uh, the colleges that are on the forefront of this, the ones that are working towards getting housing, that they're really following still their student success metrics, that they're really looking at retention, persistence, success rates of these students, and identifying if these are not the only things that are barriers, if these are only part of the story, then we need to make sure that we stay mindful of that and um, not feel like we've accomplished it until we know that th that we've satisfied the humanitarian piece, but that that also parlays into educational success for our students. So I just want to uh, make sure that we keep our eye on the prize, which is ultimately success of students and, and uh, eliminating uh, equity gaps that exist. And so I just think it's really commendable. I know that um, Imperial Valley College does a lot uh, to, for their students. And I know um, Lake Tahoe also does a lot in, on the housing front. So I think there's really great things going on in the in the system. But I would just um, hope that we could stay focused on these few things. Again, elevating the policy discussion, making it sustainable and institutionalizable, and making sure that we're not stopping here, assuming these are the only barriers our students have. And again, thanks, thanks for this uh, presentation and your work in this area. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, I want to thank everybody for the presentation. I remember probably over four years ago, I went to the first uh, conference. It was in Long Beach, given by Cal State LA. And then we had our own uh, sort of housing and food insecurity conference, I guess three or four years ago. And I think that's where I met uh, Dr. Garcia and she was vying for the position. And so we're just so pleased that she got it and she's doing such extraordinary things. So I wanna thank her and everyone else for uh, this wonderful presentation. <coughs> You're actually doing God's work because this, this is really, really extraordinary. And uh, I want to thank you all. Thanks. Other board members. Tom, um, it's Kevin. So this is Pam. Um, I think uh, Member Hall has the floor for a moment. So this is um, Pam. Um, go ahead, go, go ahead, Pam. No, no, go ahead, Kevin. Go ahead. Okay. Um, since food was uh, listed as the number one priority, um, I had a question about the food pantries, which I'm just not that familiar with. Can you can you describe a little bit more about what's in the food pantries? Is it canned food, is it fresh fruit and fresh vegetables? Um, how, how much food can a student get and, and how often can you go to the pantry to get food? And then I have a follow-up question after that. Me, 
may I answer that from our own experience? Sure. And um, this is under the current conditions. When when we had when students were on campus, uh, students had access to food every day and multiple times a day because, especially for our students who are healthy and insecure, they would uh, spend. I would have some students that would arrive at about 5 36 a.m and leave at about 10 when the last bus left so it was a different situation currently the students receive fruits and vegetables uh, today they're receiving chicken because our collaboration it's with also with the food bank so we don't only provide food that is uh, purchased through SCA or through um, the foundation since we have several community members that donate on a monthly basis to our food pantry. Um, students receive, obviously, those that receive the food from the food pantry will receive chicken, eggs, sometimes milk. Um, they, if they receive food directly from um, our IBC kitchen, it's fruits and vegetables in a box and then they receive cans bread, uh, it depends on what uh, was gathered. Um, but I could tell you that because we're not doing these uh, food distribution events as often as we used to, they're receiving uh, food for multiple weeks. And we also take into consideration, especially if they're um, participating in uh, the food bank um, uh, distribution that they also receive uh, plenty for the family members. So some of them will receive food for up to 10 family members. Kevin, can I, just, I'll just, uh, I, I can give you a couple examples from my campus. So we have a standing food pantry that is like what you're describing, cans, non-perishables, um, um, hygiene items, those types of things that students can go into every single day and get things out of that pantry. Um, then we have a then we have um, a partnership with um, Feed San Diego because there's this real belief by that organization that there's not a food shortage problem. There's a few food distribution problem. So we've been using college campuses as a distribution center for students to come and get then fresh fruits and vegetables and whatever the um, Feed San Diego has been able to collect. And those were happening, I believe, at the time every other week. And then there were also weekly pop-up markets that would come. So they would just have a smaller, like they bring four, like literally 40 tons of food to the food market when that happens. But then every week there's a smaller sort of produce pop-up market that happens that students could go do. I'm not fully aware of how we're doing food distribution right now, but I do know we're still doing farmer's markets. There are still people on campus that are are volunteering to go in and, and uh, help distribute food to people. So I know there are still ongoing efforts. I'm just not sure how often that's happening. So it's kind of a three-part effort on our campus, just to give you some scope. And, and, and just to follow up, is, is food prepared for the students or is it raw food then that the students go home and, and cook for themselves? In our case, it's raw food that they go home and prepare themselves, yeah. Same here. And the students, we know them that well. Um, it's important to recognize if they don't have a stove at home, obviously you wouldn't give them uh, chicken. They will take additional cans, they will take bread, they will take food that will last longer. Um, it is important to recognize that some of them do not have a place to store perishable items. Vice President Haynes. Sorry. Vice President Haynes. Okay, so um, I do have a question, but I wanted to um, um, sort of follow what Kim um, said relative to elevating this issue um, and, and really um, staying true to following through um, to make certain that um, the elevation means action. Um, and keeps this at, at, the, at the top of, in many cases, at the top of our list because um, I'll just give you a perfect example. Um, the African American um, Advisory Panel did um, um, uh, town halls in which we really solicited um, our students in those, in those different cities to come and to share. 
and just one example of um, we we had questions for for the group. We did breakout sessions, and we you know asked more academic kinds of things to try to tease out you know what their challenges were in the classroom. And I, I was profoundly um, affected by one of the students who sat in the back, and I asked that question, and his response was threefold. Uh, one, that he was, um, he was sleeping on someone's couch, that um, a friend of his had been shot the day before, and that he did not know where his next meal was coming. And so it was very, very hard for him to talk about what's going to happen in the classroom that what he had to deal with in the moment were those three things and he was consumed by those, which really confirms um, what so many of us um, are saying that these basic elements are, can be barriers to one success in the classroom if our students make it in, but it can also be failure for them because they are they are um, overwhelmed in many cases by just the need to survive. And so our food pantries, places and safe places for our students to go are critically important. And it's one of the fears that I have in that our, 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 schools, are, our, our schools are not open now. And so it becomes doubly, triply hard um, to have any safe places or to even know when those safe places are available, um, which is um, sometimes the lifeline, not just um, physically, um, nutritionally, but emotionally. And so that's the work that we have to do. And it's even more important in this moment because as 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 um, as those who work in policy, as those who um, are, are looking at big picture and budgets and all of those things, at the very core of that are these values. And so we can't lose sight when we start looking at our budgets. We can't lose sight of this these important elements so that our students are successful. <laughs> Thank you. I did uh, have, <clears throat> excuse me, I did have a question relative to, I'm sorry, I, I, did, ha I did have a question relative to um, how, how are our students um, accessing on our campuses what is available to them um, and how do they know that it is available to them? And maybe Martha, you can speak to that a little bit. So for the students that are self-identified as um, homeless students, we do direct communication with them, um, not only by email. I'm certain you're aware that uh, trying to reach students by email, frankly, is, is very difficult. Students don't respond to the emails or read them either, right? Much. Um, and so we're directly targeting those students because those are our most vulnerable students. However, uh, we do a weekly what's happening um, on campus and it's an email um, and it's it's also conveyed on and shared on social media. And with that weekly what's happening, the students are aware if there's going to be a food distribution or what is occurring, um, especially like our uh, mental well-being workshops. So that's how we're communicating. I. Um, could share with you that social media is for us, and I believe for most of the campuses, the best way to communicate with students. And um, so for example, for today, the students pre-register um, so that we are aware who will be attending. And we wanna make sure that we serve them, we serve them efficiently. And then we also need to determine how many home deliveries are necessary. So that is our main method of communication. But for the students that are most vulnerable, it's targeting and texting them and calling them um, 
it has to be intrusive, especially under the current circumstances. We, we do something similar, Pam, but we've also launched, and I don't know how successful it's been, um, a survey that students can voluntarily fill out, which asks them a series of questions about their food insecurity, housing insecurity, as a way for us to have a more targeted uh, approach. And it can be, and it's not just food and housing, it's a number of different services that we offer that might they might benefit from if we're aware of, of their needs. So I'm not sure um, how successful they've been in collecting, you know, how readily students have provided that information. But we also find that social media is the easiest and best way for us to get information out to students. Uh, they generally tend to shy away from email, but do get on Instagram and Twitter and a number of other places like that. Even to fill classes, we use social media. So uh, it's definitely uh, something that people need to be aware of if they want to reach students. Thank you so much. So member Escobar Carrillo, are you still around? Yeah, I think she had to leave, but she asked me to ask this question for her. Um, I am I am interested in understanding how impactful outreach efforts to encourage folks to apply for CalFresh are going. Do we know how many CCC students are enrolled in CalFresh? Do we have a sense of what is the best way to help move from outreach to actual action enrollment? I feel like it would be a good to dig a layer deeper on this front as budgets get tight. We really need to leverage existing programs like CalFresh. I'm happy to address that. I think that's an excellent point when we're looking at policies and changing practices. Um, that is an area we, um, the Chancellor's Office in partnership with many colleges and through the leadership of the Affordability Task Force last year sponsored AB 612, uh, which was one more step in helping um, students qualify for um, and apply for CalFresh. Um, since there are counties where they were not able to participate in that if, if, um, if they didn't have an MOU. So this has made it easier to accept DBT. A next step um, of our work um, is really to champion um, how many students are um, receiving information about CalFresh and um, getting uh, resources to apply um, and that uh, we, we take similar practices of intrusive um, and supporting them um, and getting these additional resources for food assistance. One key is uh, really changing the dialogue that um, food aid is just another form of financial assistance that we should be leveraging uh, and including as part of a student's package. So, so um, thank you. Thank you for that. I think it's a great focus. Thanks. Are there any other board comments or questions? I think uh, Epps, Colm and then I did. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, Colm, Colm, yes. Thank you uh, so much. Um, you know, I, I wanna start by um, thanking uh, my fellow board members who uh, brought this issue forward again. This is, if I had to carefully pick an issue um, and, and highlighted above all others, which plagues our students. Um, financial aid reform, basic needs as a part of that would be number one, um, especially in the areas of our state which have been identified in the vision for success, which need extra attention. One of those being my hometown, Stockton in the Central Valley. Um, and so definitely wanna thank my fellow board members and also of course, President Garcia, um, for your work in serving your students um, with the amazing stuff that Imperial Valley is doing. This is a tough issue uh, for me to talk about without getting sort of emotional because it's hard to understand um, from a perspective, uh, a statewide perspective um, from which we serve, um, this eclectic overview. Uh, it's hard to visualize how students um, on the ground level are suffering every day um, as a result of a lack of focus and attention uh, on this issue. Um, I want to take a second to, to talk about uh, very quickly uh, a student who really impacted my life. Um, there was a student at San Joaquin Delta College named uh, Jared Vargas. Jared Vargas, and I've told this story to Chancellor's Office's staff before, um, 
he was a member of the Associated Student Organization at Delta College when I was joining um, and actually broke the tie to give me a voice um, and to elect me uh, to the Associated Student Organization as president. He was the president. Um, so Jared is one of the few people in my life who I would refer to as saintly. I have met very, very, very few people um, who were, as I say, um, nice for no reason. Excuse me. I think it would have been impossible for me to see that when Jared elected and appointed me, he was homeless and living out of his car. Despite the incredible work he was doing every day, advocating for students, this was a student that had nothing and was starving and was, and was struggling in his academic performance because he would have to sit in front of McDonald's to get Wi-Fi. Sorry. There are thousands, thousands and thousands of students like J Jared across the state who suffer every day as a result of this issue not being solved. And so again, I, um, I wanted to thank my colleagues who brought this issue forward. Uh, and again, uh, thank President Garcia for amazing work. And I really hope that the Board of Governors will focus on this issue and will fight for our students who are suffering every day. Every day, there's not a solution. Thank you. Thank you. Member Rawlings. Yeah, I, I would say I echo uh, Combs' sentiments here. Um, I, I can name dozens, <laughs> I mean, seriously, in, in a similar situation. Um, and they've been outstanding students, as, as Martha had said. Uh, these are students who um, were, you know, especially now where they haven't been able to work in things, um, you know, compounding problems for them. But um, they would have no place to go but to be on campus and study and be there and supporting other students and serving and being activists and speaking up for, for those students who had less. Um, so I want to go from <laughs> kind of where we're at to, to action, right? Uh, and so there's so much in the presentation, Martha, that, um, that I think is uh, really needs deeper dives, right? One of the areas where, um, where I'm kind of concerned is uh, people like my friend Donna, who, who spent you know, basically three years living out of her car and eating from the food banks and, and those kind of things and has now graduated in, onto UC Irvine, getting them to not have to live out of the car or on the street or in our bushes. Uh, and so I, I love the tiny home project that you'd shared. Uh, and, and I think kind of as I heard through some of what you were talking about, um, there are components of it that I think to me kind of get past where some of our traditional roadblocks were. Uh, one of which is uh, not having it need to be on campus right? Not on the physical site. Um, because some of our, our sites are kind of landlocked, right? And so you found a site that's a little more remote and then made sure that it was a site that had transportation to the college. Uh, I, I wanted to kind of hear back from you about the relationship you have with the city with, you know, who owns the property? Is it one that you purchased? Um, and then uh, how are you kind of making that product really come to life? And uh, what are the stumbling blocks that you're facing in trying to do that? Because I think if, even if you were able to have multiple small sites like that with the tiny homes and, and meeting pockets of need, um, then we're at least chipping away until we can really come to a substantive um, solution to our, our uh, financial aid problems. But, but beyond that, just our societal problems that have led to um, you know, an economy where these students are homeless and starving. Thank you. So the city of El Centro owns the land. Uh, they've agreed to rent it to us uh, initially for a year. 
And um, so we're in the process right now where they're developing that agreement. Their attorney is working on it. And um, the goal is that we would have the opportunity to purchase um, if, if we deem that we're going to continue to uh, move forward with the project. And my goal is to expand. So luckily that piece of land is located next to a land that is available if we uh, wanted to expand. The greatest challenge is funding and that has been my greatest priority as the president for this college is I am committed and I publicly stated that we will have the lowest cost of housing for our students, which may be for some no cost at all. And the only way I could do that is to fundraise. So the initial funding that has been allocated to that project has been provided by local farmers. And I continue to um, do that. I continue to seek funding because I, it's important that we pay hopefully as much as we can for the project and maybe all of it uh, with uh, different funding sources so that our students don't have to pay much. It would be minimal uh, amount that they would pay for maintenance and they would be required to volunteer and support with obviously the, the, the maintenance of, of the um, community. But at the end of the day, I cannot add another barrier to their current conditions charging them a significant amount to live there will add another barrier and that's not what we're trying to do and i will end by sharing that as community colleges we will never have enough to do the work that needs to be done for our students but we have a responsibility which is why some of these projects as busy as i am I make them um, a priority and I invest the time that I need to invest so that we continue moving forward. And I don't do this alone. I do it with the support of my team, but the fundraising is one of the priorities that I've made for, for this project. Thank you. Um, are there any other board member comments or questions? Okay, if not, then we have some public comments I know already and uh, we can um, look forward yeah. to more. Tom, do you mind if I make oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I do want to echo my colleague, uh, Felisa Carrillo Escobar, on the need to leverage resources. Uh, absolutely agree. Uh, but this burden should be shouldered by the city, by the county, by the local community, and not singularly by the community colleges. Because as you stated, there's never going to be sufficient resources within the system to address these challenges. And these are far more endemic beyond the community college system. So I really hope that part of the engagement strategy is about in engaging these local elected officials who should also bear responsibility for addressing these challenges. And I'm hoping through those uh, partnerships that we're able to leverage resources, attract funding, and really, again, uh, have them co-own the problem in a way that the community colleges are not bearing it on their own. Thank you. Thank you. I have a comment, Super Tom. Great. Okay, uh, Member Shaw. Yeah, I just wanted to say how proud we are of uh, Member Fitzgerald and, and what a wonderful job he's doing representing students and what a very moving, um, story he told about his life and the life of the students that uh, were that, at the school that he attends. And so I just want to say we're proud of him. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to quickly echo a member Shaw's comment. Okay. Me too. Thanks. I, I want to say that Dr. Garcia and Colm are exemplars. Uh, they're kind of empathetic, caring professionals that our students are fortunate to have serving and representing them. So um, really both of you, I think your, your empathy radiates all the way through a Zoom call and, and down to the students that you serve. So thank you. And I wanna thank also um, Vice Chancellors Alvarado and Navarrete 
sorry if I demoted or promoted you, I can never remember the bite, um, um, for continuing to remind us about the inequitable distribution of aid to our students. As much as is going on right now, it's something we cannot forget. So the constant reminder and um, that that is there and it's something we need to keep at the forefront of our agenda is really important. So thank you both for your work on that. Okay, um, so let's, uh, let's move into public comment. The comment period for item 5.1 is now open. Please submit your comments through the Q&A feature of the Zoom platform and include the item number in your submission. You can either identify yourself or specify that you would like to remain anonymous in the comment, and it will then be read out loud by a chancellor's office staff member. I have received three comments on this item, um, and I will read them now. First comment, are part-time faculty eligible for food distributions? Uh, next comment, how we link have we looked into refer a friend incentives? A lot of people will not ask for help. It is difficult to share with others food insecurity. And the final comment through the Q&A, thank you for making this a priority at IBC, Dr. Garcia. Looking forward to hearing what the CCC plans to do to help address this challenge. And those are all the comments received on this item through the Q&A. President Epstein, I have received two comments for this item. I will read them now. Good morning, Chancellor Oakley, President Epstein, Vice President Haynes, and members of the Board of Governors. We are grateful for your leadership advocating for our students and our state. My name is Jeffrey Baum, and I am the Executive Director of M Mitchelson Philanthropies, the philanthropic enterprise led by Dr. Gary Mitchelson and his wife, Alia Mitchelson. As you know, earlier this year, I concluded my 12-year service as a member of the California Community College's Board of Governors. Mitchelson Philanthropies is comprised of three private foundations, the Mitchelson Medical Research Foundation, the Mitchelson Found Animals Foundation, and Mitchelson 20 Million Minds Foundation. The Mitchelson 20 Million Minds Foundation is devoted to helping disadvantaged students, including justice system involved students, gain access to college. We support organizations that help them stay enrolled until they graduate and help them re-enroll if they drop out. Thank you very much for putting this item on the agenda. Given the historic challenges our students are facing, I urge you to keep college cost, access, and affordability on the agenda at every meeting. The Mitchelson 20 million, 20 MM Foundation recently announced an important partnership with the Foundation for California Community Colleges and Compton College to find ways to get student emergency aid so they, des they so desperately need. Furthermore, as our system has transitioned to online instruction, we have identified another challenge for our students and want to bring it to your attention. The exorbitant cost of textbooks has been a significant issue dating back more than a decade. We have made some progress, but publishers are shifting their tactics to extract even more revenue while removing important alternatives for students. Many are now requiring students to purchase access codes rather than actual textbooks. By doing so, they are now locking students and colleges into expensive automatic billings, contracts that fail to disclose pricing, require quotas, and restrict options. In many cases, students need these codes just to submit homework or complete other required assignments. There are better options, such as freely available open educational resources and zero-cost textbook degree programs. At Mitchelson 20 Million Minds Foundation, we helped launch OpenStax, a free nonprofit library with dozens of peer-reviewed textbooks that are being used by millions of students in California and around the world. We urge you to continue your focus on these issues. We call on you, the Academic Senate, and our other system partners to support common sense measures like price transparency to ensure that students of all income levels have the resources and options they need to succeed. Thank you very much. This concludes this comment. The second comment, I will read it right now. Good morning, Chancellor Oakley, President Epstein, Vice President Haynes, and members of the Board of Governors. My name is Myra Lombera, and I am Vice President of Programs and Operations at the Mitchelson 20 Million Minds 20 MM Foundation. For more than a decade, our organization has been dedicated to improving access, affordability, and student success to post-secondary education. First off, I'd like to thank the board for your shared commitment and continued work to advance issues of affordability to help drive down the total cost of college. Since our founding in 2010, 
we have been a leader in textbook affordability measures, seeding the largest nonprofit open educational resources publisher, OpenStax. This year alone, over 3 million students across our nation's institutions of higher education will benefit from using an OpenStax title, a library that has grown to include 38 textbooks and produced $830 million in student savings. California's community colleges are amongst its benefactors, thanks to incredible faculty who have taken the initiative to revise the curriculum and replace costly textbooks with free materials. These faculty heroes have helped strengthen equity measures since research supports that learners perform at least as well or better with high quality, no cost content. Given every dollar invested in open stacks has produced over $14 in student savings, we urge the board to continue supporting investments in open educational resources. One such measure that advances textbook affordability is that a zero text cost degree program for the last year, we have led efforts to advocate the additional, to advocate for additional funding for ZTC degrees, and we thank the Board of Governors for including the one-time funding in your original budget request to Governor Newsom this year. The program, as you know, creates entire pathways where students can complete a degree by taking courses that use only free instructional materials. Unfortunately, the 10 million dollar one-time allocation included in the governor's January budget was removed as a result of COVID-19's statewide fiscal impact. In a recent poll we funded, our partner and grantee, the Educational Trust West, asked students across California's higher educational institutions what resources and support they were receiving from their institutions during COVID-19. Finding shows that while 91% of respondents felt that, that online no-cost textbooks would be helpful in completing their studies. Only 20% reported that their institution was providing these resources. These fundings bring us here today to urge the board to again include, to again include the ZTC program in the next year's budget request, since it is our most vulnerable students who stand behind or stand to benefit and are desperately looking for assistance during these times of financial uncertainty. Second, as you know, the challenge of meeting students' basic needs was difficult prior to the COVID-19 public health crisis, and our current content has only exacerbated the situation for many students. With half of California Community College students experiencing food insecurity and a fifth of them experiencing homelessness, it will be critical that the California Community College System, Chancellor's Office, and Board of Governors continue their focus on establishing supports to meet student basic needs. This, can, this includes improving the distribution of emergency aid for students facing economic shortfalls who simply cannot afford to wait. Most recently, the Mitchelson 20 and M Foundation announced an important partnership with the Foundation for California Community Colleges and Compton College to improve emergency aid distribution programs across our state colleges. The goal of the project is to ensure students have quick and equitable access to emergency aid and critical support resources. The project was seeded in response to early findings showing students currently face processes for applying for and receiving assistance that are cumbersome, time-consuming, slow, and inequitable, meaning students are unable to access the support they need when they need it the most. The project will partner with software platform EdQuity. To date, EdQuity has processed and awarded thousands of applicants demonstrating improved efficiency, student satisfaction, and student satisfaction. Students will have been able to- Christina, I, I think we're way over the three minutes here. Can you uh, just, uh, we'll submit the rest of that letter to the- uh, so the comments for everyone. Certainly. Okay, and make sure that the that the board sees the rest of those comments. Um, so uh, I want to I want to wrap this up uh, and then take a short break. But uh, I want to I want to thank uh, very much President Garcia for her um, her excellent presentation. Um, like others, I want to acknowledge uh, the power of uh, Member Fitzgerald's. Uh, presentation and, and reminding us all of the uh, of the really personal human impact this has. I know that uh, I've traveled around to a bunch of campuses with uh, Member Rawlings, Vice President Haynes, uh, Member Perry, and others, uh, and we always meet with students. And rarely is there a collection of students that there isn't at least one who is uh, housing insecure. And so uh, we have been able to hear firsthand. Um, 
of the uh, of the devastating impact. And uh, and we really uh, I agree with many others here who say this has to be you know a top of mind urgent priority, and we can never let uh, those who have the ability in policy arena to to forget that how critical this is. So. Um, Thank you all uh, for your for your efforts on this. And uh, as we move into our next item, which is the budget uh, and legislation, we'll uh, we'll be able to talk a little bit more about this. So uh, thanks uh, everyone. And I want to uh, let's take a, a break and come back um, at uh, 10:45, which is in nine minutes. Okay, uh, thanks everyone. I, I want to, uh, before we move on to the next time, I do want to thank uh, our former board president, uh, Jeffrey Baum, and his associate for um, their comments uh, in support of what we're doing and their uh, commitment to, uh, to, to help our foundation as well. We appreciate it and so glad that uh, Jeff is uh, still on board after many, many years of, uh, of service to the community colleges. Uh, so with that, uh, we want to go to item 5.3, the state budget update and 2021-22 budget request. Thank you, um, President uh, Epps, Epstein, um, uh, Lizette Neverett, Vice Chancellor for College Finance and Facilities Planning, and thank you, members of the board. Today, I'll provide a brief update on the 2021 enacted state budget. Um, and this uh, item will also uh, discuss how we are preparing for the 21-22 state budget through a shared advocacy request. Next slide, please. So the, the budget was enacted uh, by uh, Governor Newsom on June 30th, and this included a three-party compromise. Uh, the budget essentially uh, prevents cuts to apportionments and categoricals. However, in order to accomplish this, uh, the budget um, includes 1.5 billion in deferrals for community colleges and provides no COLA and enrollment growth. Uh, deferrals are essentially an IOU from the state and a promise for payment in a future budget year. Of the $1.5 billion in deferrals, uh, $791 million can trigger off if Congress approves a fourth stimulus package. Next slide. Uh, before you, you see the um, anticipated uh, deferral schedule um, and uh, one way that colleges deal with deferrals is through utilizing local reserves and borrowing. Next slide. Uh, to give you a sense of the magnitude of these deferrals this year, um, you'll see that our office distributes resources to colleges through what's called local assistance funding. Um, and of that, um, 3.5 billion comes from the state general fund, including the education protection account. And so this budget is essentially deferring um, a large amount of that money, or, um, leaving only uh, about $2 billion for distribution to colleges this fiscal year. Next slide, please. One um, positive element that was included in the budget, um, part of uh, our uh, joint uh, legislative request, um, part of um, the work that we did in partnership with many of colleges and organizations that joined us in a joint letter of over 75 organizations, is the inclusion of a $120 million block grant. Uh, these funds come from two sources. One is from federal and one is from state. Um, the federal portion um, does uh, expire by uh, December 30th. And so we, we are working diligently to ensure that colleges receive these funds, can start planning. Um, as you know, we don't want to leave any federal dollars on the table. So we will work um, with campuses to ensure these do do dollars are utilized to best serve our students. Allowable uses include professional development and investment in the digital divide, um, as well as other barriers faced by students, faculty, and staff in colleges during COVID-19. Uh, uh, PPE, personal protective equipment, is also an allowable use. Next slide, please. For categoricals, this budget prevents cuts um, and um, program spending remains at the 2019-2020 level. 
Uh, two in particular that we shared um, during the May presentation um, were, were spared and additional language was included in the trailer bill. For student equity and, and achievement, um, there, these funds um, will be used to also establish food distribution programs on campuses and food pantries. And then for strong workforce, there is a focus and encouragement of creating short term programs that can um, support the reskilling and upskilling of individuals through proven practices such as uh, credit for prior learning and competency based education. Next slide, please. Um, a little bit more about categoricals. The budget defers the creation of the system support program, but it does include 10 million for ongoing support for immigrant legal services and provides 5.8 million um, for Dream Resource Center's liaisons, um, consistent with the prior bill that was enacted in 2019. Next slide, please. And then there's also language about um, the uh, classified employees and they may not be laid off between uh, July 1st, 2020 through June 30th of 2021. Next slide, please. Uh, and then consistent with the Board of Governors priority, uh, capital outlay was prioritized and um, all of the plans submitted by this board were approved for funding uh, through the use of Prop 51, the bond that was approved by voters in 2016. Uh, next slide, please. There is also a relief for uh, our colleges through um, general fund, um, and this includes a relief for um, a buy down of employer contribution rate increases in the amount of 2.3 million, 2.3 billion dollars. Um, this means that uh, for CalPERS and CalSTRS, employer rates will not increase this year. Before you, you see uh, the new adjusted rates. Next slide, please. Some of the other provisions I'll mention briefly is in, um, are that uh, COVID-19 related expenses will be excluded from the 50% law calculation. This language in the trailer bill will expire um, by July 1st of 2021. The budget reduces Calbright by 25% and 40 million ongoing one time. There is resources for um, a fair, play to, uh, fair Pay to Play Act uh, work group that will be convened by the chancellor's office and um, emergency aid for undocumented students through general fund again addressing total cost of attendance in the tune of 11 million dollars that will be designated for California community college students and undocumented students attending community colleges and next slide please so the next steps that we're really working on is where we will be releasing resources and an allocation schedule for the COVID-19 block grant so that uh, colleges may utilize those resources um, effectively by December 30th. Uh, we will be working with colleges on how to deal with these magnitudes of deferrals and including a schedule and ways um, to find resources and cash flow during this time. And most importantly, we'll be, we will be working with colleges to ensure that all of the budget decisions at this time um, that can be student centered in spite of this recession. Um, so I know that I went through many of these topics very quickly, but I do want to let you know that we have a comprehensive joint analysis available uh, on the link provided in your agenda item and in this link here where you can read more details about the budget. And then with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Vice Chancellor David O'Brien. Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor Navarrete. We wanted to give the Board of Governors a brief update on where we are in preparing um, what we're calling our shared advocacy request for what will be uh, the 2021-22 budget and legislative request process. So as in previous years, the divisions of uh, College Finance and Government Relations are working in full partnership on this. Very pleased to count by Chancellor Navarrete and her team um, as strong partners. And if we could move to the next slide. Just a little bit about the context of the advocacy environment. Um, obviously, uh, the news is not great overall. It takes place within the context of a worldwide economic recession brought on by a uh, major public health crisis, restructured legislative calendar and deadlines, as well as the fact that both this year and we anticipate probably next year, the legislature and uh, perhaps the governor 
may want to have a more um, intentional focus on some specific policy issues that uh, that they view uh, as high priority. You may recall that earlier this year, the governor dedicated his entire state at the state address to addressing the state's homelessness and affordable housing crisis. We also have wildfires and um, our ongoing energy problems, all of which are gonna be seen um, uh, in as well as COVID-19 related legislation and budget items as top priorities. So that is why we are bringing in so many of our system stakeholders, our consultation council partners, as well as our partners in the field as, um, as joint advocacy partners, we're calling it shared advocacy, to really speak with one voice. And as we look to our unmet priorities from this year, we are providing a little bit more of a focus to the extent we can, while still, of course, encouraging an open and democratic and transparent process from our stakeholders. Next slide, please. So this is just a brief overview of the process. We have met with our consultation council partners to review unmet priorities. We are currently developing um, a priority list ranked in priority order of what we think should be carried over as well as what should be added to the 2021-22 shared advocacy requests. Vice Chancellor Navarrete and I will be working to distribute the list more broadly, both uh, inside of as well as outside of our consultation council partners. We want as much input from the field um, uh, as possible here. And then we will of course be working to align the final draft request to the vision for success as we prepare to bring it to the Board of Governors. Next slide, please. So just looking at our timeline and I, I want to um, just reiterate that uh, 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 time, timelines and, and deadlines are unfortunately shifting quite a bit as we look to these, but um, this uh, update here today is just an update on the process and we will be reaching out to our stakeholder listservs uh, over the next couple of weeks, holding a webinar to discuss our received, our received proposals and begin outlining the proposed request. Moving on to the next slide. We will have the final draft prepared uh, for consultation council at our August meeting. And then from there, uh, as we request sign-ons for our support letter, we will be uh, bringing it to the Board of Governors for final review and approval in September, which comes in advance of the deadline for submitting budget change proposals to the Department of Finance uh, at the end of the month. And then once again, reviewing it with our system constituents in early October as we rev up our advocacy process and uh, prepare to um, advocate uh, alongside our students, faculty, and partners to the governor and to the legislature next year. Next slide, please. And so uh, that concludes our presentation. I think we wanted to open it up for public comments or board questions. Recognize it was very brief, but it was largely a status update on where we are in the process. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Um, are there any um, board comments or questions? I just had a clarifying question. <clears throat> Lizette, in your presentation, particularly under the COVID, emergency um, funding. It indicated that the system had until December of this year to um, complete the first allocation, but had until 2022 to complete the second. Is that accurate? That is correct. Oh, oh, okay. Yes, thank you. Um, so for, for clarification, the block grant of $120 million comes from two sources, 54 million from federal funds and 66 million from uh, state funds. The federal portion has a shorter expenditure period. And so we're focusing um, so that we don't have to give those dollars back to the federal government. Any other board comments, questions? Okay, let's uh, let's go to public comment. The public comment period for item 5.3 is now open. Please submit your comments through the Q&A feature of the Zoom platform and include the item number in your submission. You can either identify yourself or specify that you would like to remain anonymous in your comment. Your comment will then be read out loud by a chancellor's office staff member. I have received one comment on this item so far, and I will read it now. Good morning, Board of Governors. This is Debbie Klein, President of the Faculty Association of California Community Colleges. 
VAC has been engaged in the discussions of the Funding Formula Oversight Committee for the past year and a half. When it comes to adjusting the funding formula during a recession, increasing the base allocation is the most equitable approach. Base funding ensures that colleges are able to offer the courses our students need. Base funding is about equity for the residents of California who are low income, minoritized, and underrepresented. If our potential students do not have access to our colleges, how can we meet the goals of the Chancellor's vision for success? We do not want to repeat the same mistake we made during the last recession when we turned away 600,000 students. Regarding the budget request, FAC would like to see a final budget request that reflects a unified system voice. We must focus only on the priorities that every system stakeholder can support. And that is the only comment that I have received so far. I have not received any public comments on this item. Okay, um, we'll give another few seconds to see if anybody else has a public comment. I have received one more comment here to the Q&A and I will read it now. I was wondering what kind of priority is mental health getting in the allocation of the block grant? Is correspondence going out to colleges on this issue? A lack in basic needs resources is causing a decrease in mental health for our students. And there are no other comments at this time. Okay. Uh, with that then, we'll, we'll uh, thank you both vice chancellors and we'll move on to uh, 5.4, the federal and state update. And uh, Mr. O'Brien, you're still on. Yes, I am. Thank you. Uh, thank you, President Epstein. Uh, pleased to prevent a, present a uh, fairly brief update on state and federal government relations issues. Um, first, just an operational issue. I know I am repeating what Chancellor Oakley said yesterday, but just want to say once again, we are so pleased that um, in early August, we will be welcoming Linda Vasquez to our team as Assistant Vice Chancellor for State and Federal Relations. I've known Linda for many years, and I know that many of you do as well. We're very excited to have her coming over from the Campaign for College Opportunity. Um, we're sorry to the Campaign for College Opportunity, of course, but we're very excited to have Linda joining us. We think that her, um, her wealth of advocacy and coalition building experience combined with her familiarity with so many of our major system priorities and partners and stakeholders will be a real asset to our team. So Linda will be um, reporting directly to me and uh, you will get a chance to meet her at our September Board of Governors meeting, uh, for those of you that haven't met her already. On state legislation, which is the first of the uh, two uh, items we have here under item five, if it's 5.1, yes. Um, on state uh, legislation and advocacy, just a quick update, mostly on the state legislature itself. So the state legislature was scheduled to uh, reconvene from its summer recess uh, last week. However, unfortunately, there was a, a small outbreak of COVID-19 positive tests um, in the state capitol building among members and staff. So the legislature took an extended recess. Uh, they are currently anticipating returning next week. However, because there is still a constitutional deadline uh, for adjournment at the end of August for adjournment of the two-year 2019-2020 legislative session, this means an even more compressed calendar, and it means that it's likely that even more of the bills that we've seen um, in this already uh, restricted year will uh, not be moving forward. Uh, earlier uh, this year, as you may recall, leaders in the legislature asked members to significantly scale back their normal bill load by 80%, sometimes more, to really focus on those that were highest priority directly related to COVID-19, um, had minimal cost or operational impacts, uh, and, and, and so forth. Uh, and with the compressed timeline, again, for this last month of session that we're hearing up here for, we anticipate that we'll see even more bills uh, being dropped by their authors with the anticipation of picking them up again in the 2021 session. So uh, at this time, most of the major high impact legislation that we were in, uh, following and analyzing is not being carried over. Uh, however, we are of course continuing our advocacy on those bills that are remaining. And if members of the board have questions about any particular legislation, uh, more than happy to address them now. Brief update on federal policy and advocacy as well. So our main concern on the federal front, as you know. Wait, David, David oh, before, you go to, before you go to the federal, let's see if we have any questions about of state. Of course. Uh, any, any board members have questions about state uh, policy and bills? 
President Epstein? Yeah. I don't have a, a question necessarily, but I would just like to highlight uh, one of these bills specifically. In our earlier conversation about um, housing and homelessness, uh, one of these bills is of utmost importance in achieving um, kind of uh, alleviating some of the stresses that students face day to day in those positions. And that would be AB 2884, uh, Berman, the California State Lotter Lottery uh, Revenue Allocation. I just wanted to highlight this bill and, and uh, make it clear that the Student Senate for California Community Colleges is uh, vehemently supporting this. Um, and if we really want to try to tackle the food and housing problems in the system, uh, the success of this bill would do a great deal. Thank you, board member. Um, I would concur and the chancellor's office is in support of this legislation as well. And very, very thankful to the SSCCC for their leadership on this issue. Any other questions from board members? Yeah. No one else does, I do. On um, the uh, AB 1343, the uh, 8515 rule that uh, uh, targets for-profit colleges, um, is there any chance that's gonna move or is that pretty much dead for this session? Um, I, I would have to look into, to get a more sort of up to the moment status update, President Epstein, but um, I will tell you that that has been a political challenge um, in general, the past couple of years, that particular bill has actually been uh, what we call gutted and amended this session, meaning that in its current form, it won't be moving. There is still a possibility that if uh, members or leadership consider it a high enough priority, it could, could get added to another bill or omnibus legislation. But um, in its current form as AB 1343, uh, it won't be moving forward. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I know there's some, uh, just, I'm sorry, but there's some federal litigation uh, around this issue as well, right? The, uh, yes. And, and that's what you're going to talk about right now, so I'll let you go on. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't have that specific one in here, but I, I am aware of that federal litigation. It is, um, it is one of many policies that the current administration in Washington is trying to implement uh, against uh, significant pushback, both political and legal. Um, some of it, as you know, successful legal pushback. On the federal side, um, much of our advocacy over the past few months has been around a fourth uh, COVID stimulus bill, which is uh, uh, referred to as C4 in sort of Washingtonese. Uh, as you may recall, the CARES Act passed all the way back in March, uh, and there's since been a significant um, delay in getting new stimulus legislation passed. Uh, there has been some uh, partisan back and forth the Democratic controlled House passed a bill called the HEROES Act in May. Uh, very narrowly, the Republican controlled Senate has indicated that they have no intention on bringing forward that particular bill. But in recent weeks, uh, Senate uh, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and other Republicans have indicated that they see a need for, um, for some type of stimulus legislation. And uh, to uh, our benefit and to the benefit of our students, one of the priority areas that uh, both Democrats agree needs to be a focus of that is education, both K-12 and higher education. And so um, there are discussions ongoing right now about what that stimulus bill would look like. I uh, want to highlight two issues that we're following very, very closely, uh, one of which you're aware of and it was sort of implicated in the recent lawsuit around the Student Exchange and Visitor Program, which is that there is a strong desire on the part of the Trump administration and many Republicans to provide financial incentives for both K-12 schools and colleges and universities to reopen and offer in-person education. Uh, it has been the position of the chancellor's office uh, all along that that is a decision that uh, should be made by practitioners, uh, of course, in compliance, in close uh, compliance with local health officials as to what is best for the health and safety of the students and staff, not something that should be dictated from Washington. Um, oddly an odd sort of thing to even be talking about with a Republican administration typically. The other issue that, um, that has come up in recent days, and I apologize that we don't have it in our write-up, but it's sort of late breaking, uh, is the issue of how relief funds for institutions of higher education would be allocated. So briefly, you may recall that the CARES Act passed in March allocated relief funds on, uh, according to the share of full-time equivalent Pell recipient students 
uh, that an institution has, which was a significant disadvantage for uh, California community colleges and community colleges nationwide, which tend to have a lower share of full-time students and a lower share of students receiving Pell Grant compared to four-year university counterparts. Uh, the Democratic-controlled House did pass in the HEROES Act in May provisions calling for that allocation to be based on total headcount, which would be uh, more equitable for our institutions and for our students. However, in recent days, um, it has come up that there is some advocacy going on by organizations representing four-year institutions to not use total headcount, but to again use FTE. Uh, just wanted to let you know that from the Chancellor's Office, we are continuing to advocate for an equitable allocation utilizing total headcount to ensure that our institutions and our students receive the funds they need. Uh, the CARES Act formula, uh, certainly you could say it was better than no funds at all, but the CARES Act formula resulted in our institution, our students receiving about, or our segment, I should say, receiving about 25 cents on the dollar compare, per student compared to our four-year uh, counterparts. And so we are advocating very strongly, uh, and Chancellor Oakley is, uh, is uh, leading the charge on this for a more equitable allocation that properly recognizes the needs uh, and concerns of community colleges and community college students. There's also an update in here, of course, on recent federal litigation, which you heard from Chancellor Oakley, um, as well as the borrowed defense to repayment rule. Uh, this was one where there was bipartisan support for overturning the administration's recent action. Uh, however, the president did veto it. And with that, I will stop and see if there are any questions on federal issues. Any board member questions? Okay, are there any public comments? The public comment period for item 5.4 is now open. Please submit your comments through the Q&A feature of the Zoom platform and include the item number in your submission. You can either identify yourself or specify that you would like to remain anonymous in your comment. Your comment will then be read out loud by a Chancellor's Office staff member. I have received one comment on this item so far, and I will read it now. Good morning again, President Epstein, Vice President Haynes, Chancellor Oakley, and members of the Board of Governors. This is Debbie Klein, President of the Faculty Association of California Community Colleges. FAC sponsored AB 2884, which would allow for surplus lottery funds to be used for student basic needs has passed the, assemb the assembly floor and is currently in the Senate. We appreciate the Chancellor's Office's continuing support of this legislation and will continue to advocate for increased resources for our students. Now more than ever, these resources are needed to support our students. As Congress returns to session this week, FAC will be in engaging with federal representatives to advocate for increased stabilization funding for our states and colleges. We encourage the Board of Governors to advocate for this federal funding to ensure our system's fiscal resiliency. Thank you. And that is the only comment that I have received through the Q&A on this item. I have not received any public comments via email for this item. Okay, we'll give another few seconds here to see if anybody else wants to comment. Okay, hearing none, we will move on to item 5.5, uh, contracts and grants approved by the board president. Thank you, President Epstein. Uh, this item board members represents an informational item of any contracts or grants that were approved by the board president outside of a board meeting. The four contracts that, that you see in front of you were approved by the board president on June 7, 2020, so just last month as a way for our office to respond to the needs of this agency. As you know, we have 131 state employees. We previously had 138 employees. 5% of our staff has been redirected for contact tracing to help the state during this pandemic. However, we do have a number of retired annuitants and student workers. So our office needed to update our entire infrastructure. I'd be more than happy to walk through each of these or just answer your questions in many ways, they were technology upgrades as well as uh, augmentations to two specific contracts to help us facilitate the work that needs to be done during this pandemic and a lack of uh, state staff for this agency. Thank you, Deputy Chancellor. Um, 
Uh, are there any board comments about these contracts? Okay, if member Rawlings is silent, um, I guess it's, it's okay. Tom, I actually have a quick me. question. Um, oh, Bill, do okay. you have a question? Do you want to go ahead? No, no, I didn't have any questions on this. No, they were all they were all tech contracts. So I thought, you know, he was going to raise issues. We were in trouble. Yeah, could you, Tom, just give us a little bit more more context here? I thought that I read the background to say that we needed to approve these certain contracts, or that you had the authority to approve them because of the COVID nineteen emergency. But I don't think that's exactly what is trying to be reflected. So, would you mind just giving a little bit of background on this one? And if yeah, Tom can't, maybe maybe Daisy could. Um, I, I, I I'll just heard of it, Daisy in a second, but but I don't think these were. Uh, necessarily related to the uh, emergency order for COVID. These were uh, contracts that needed to be let within a certain time period and there wasn't going to be a board meeting before that time period expired or we would have lost uh, opportunities to uh, to get these kind of prices and services. So um, they had to be done between meetings and um, you know, in my view, they all seem very necessary. Uh, we all know that the technology in the chancellor's office needs a significant upgrade and all of these uh, contracts were designed to do that. I don't know, uh, 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 Deputy Chancellor Gonzalez, if you have anything uh, you wanna add? Uh, no, that's correct. Board Member uh, Aguinaldo, the other response is that these were 1920 funds. And so, as you know, state funds revert on June 30th. Board President Epstein approved this on, July, on uh, June 7th. There would have been no way that we could have made these upgrades into our agency. The funds would have reverted back. And more importantly, they were desperately needed technology upgrades that we wouldn't have known until the end of the fiscal year as our office was able to score savings due to COVID-19, you know, less travel for our agency, certain vacancies. So lots of different, um, as well as reimbursements that came in within the last 30 days of the fiscal year. So everything that you see on here on this item is using 1920 funds. Great, thank you guys for the explanation. Okay, any other board member inquiries? Any public comments? The public comment period for item 5.5 is now open. Uh, please submit your comments through the Q&A feature of the Zoom platform and include the item number in your submission. You can either identify yourself or specify that you would like to remain anonymous in your comments and it will then be read out loud by a Chancellor's Office staff member. I have not received any comments uh, for this item through the Q&A so far. I have not received any comments on this item. Okay, we'll wait a few seconds. Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to item 5.6, uh, board member reports. Have at it. I have just a couple of quick, very quick things. Um, First of all, I wanted to officially welcome uh, Dolores Davidson and Jenny May as the president and vice president of the Academic Senate for California Community Colleges. Um, I know that we mentioned that they won the election, but they're in their official roles now. And I just want to encourage the board members um, it, just to let people know that they're very accommodating. If you have questions, they're, they're great about answers. So I just, I really am looking forward to their leadership. They're going to do a great job and I'm looking forward to working with them this year. Also, I wanted to welcome Pam Luster, who's going to be representing the CEOs uh, at the board meeting. So uh, I've known Pam for many years now. She's a president of my college, a straight shooter, and also someone who's really giving with information and willing to uh, share her opinions and, and word on the street should you need to know something. So I'd encourage you to reach out to her as well. And then the final item I wanted to share was that right before the COVID uh, shut down. Uh, I had scheduled a visit to Sacramento City College. That wasn't able to happen, but I have been in uh, touch with some of their faculty members, and I think we're still going to try to get some kind of Zoom session going for um, some of the panels that we had set up uh, when the when the session uh, reschedules in the fall. So when I get details on that, I'll share it for anyone who wants to join in on that. And that's all from me. Thank you. Any other um, board? I have an update as well. Okay, member Aguinaldo. 
um, it, it's always difficult to come after Kim because she has so many substantive updates. Um, so I'm gonna try to put my updates into three main buckets. The first one is the Wednesday webinars that the Chancellor's Office has been hosting. Um, there was one particular webinar on June 3rd that was a call to action webinar. And for those of you who haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend it as one of the most powerful things I've seen. And, and Kim, correct me if I'm wrong, but Pam Lester might've been on that webinar. Um, so I, I highly encourage everyone to, to log on. It was recorded and um, I've been watching it periodically again and again um, over time. And the second general bucket of updates is, is that if there's anyone answering that call to action, it would be our chancellor's office and the statewide organizations and partners um, with respect to our DEI work. So since the last board meeting, I've attended three DEI implementation work group meetings and one statewide EO and diversity advisory committee meeting. And as to the DEI implementation work group work, um, statewide organizations and partners like the Academic Senate have gotten extremely organized in implementing the DEI integration plan. And the Academic Senate in particular presented a unique framework for success that many other statewide organizations are adopting to change their own organizational culture, but more importantly, to make progress towards our recommendations. So of note from both of those meetings is that the advancement of the Title V regulation changes, which were considered for first reading yesterday, and support for the Prop 16 board resolution came from both groups who acknowledge the barriers that Prop 209 presents to our DI um, commitment. So I want to acknowledge FACT for bringing this issue to the attention of the DI implementation work group. Um, some next steps for us are threefold. Um, first is to launch a strategic communications plan for DI. The second is to welcome board member Rawlings as the second BOG representative for the work group. Looking forward to um, board member Rawlings working uh, closely together again. And then thirdly, to provide you with an update at the September board meeting. The third general bucket is uh, taking a nod from Kim uh, to do essentially a, a, virtual, a virtual site visit. Um, and although I don't think anyone will be able to catch up to Tom in visiting over 100 million colleges, <laughs> it nonetheless may be a good idea to continue with the virtual site visit. So Los Angeles Southwest College's amazing team has offered to host us. And if you're interested, please let me know so I can loop you in. I know that there was a lot of interest when we were doing um, visits more locally to the LA Community College District. And frankly, it's very selfish of me, but I wanna see you guys. And hopefully this is conducive to more small group um, discussions. So that's it for me. Thank you. President Upside? Yes, sir. I have a, a, a little bit of a comment here. Let me pull this up. So, um, you know, I want to start my public comment by saying uh, we know that this uh, pandemic has been extremely difficult for all parties in our system. Um, but without a doubt, uh, students are bearing the brunt of most of the challenges we face. And as just one example, uh, came across an issue recently where students were completing the spring semester, uh, some of whom were so close to transferring, have been denied credit for uh, the classes they were taking part in, uh, which were canceled. Um, so President Epstein, I, I would like to request that a guidance memo uh, be put out by the Chancellor's Office urgently, clarifying colleges should be given, uh, should give partial credit for canceled spring classes. and. I would ask that the SSCCC, as a part of this process, be contacted to accurately reflect the student perspective. And um, just a little more context. A student from Monterey Peninsula College reached out to myself and the president of the Student Senate, Stephen Kudor, a couple weeks ago. And in his email, uh, relayed that the students at Monterey Peninsula College were making complaints to their ASO in increasing numbers. While these students were receiving refunds, initially, they were not receiving any partial credit at all. Uh, this despite finishing over half their coursework over half the semester. For obvious reasons, not receiving partial credit impacts every student during this pandemic, but also most importantly, uh, disproportionately our disenfranchised populations. And on March 20th, the Chancellor's Office issued a guidance memo that stated apportionment may be claimed for students that withdrew from classes due to COVID-19. So in some instances, Students who were forced to withdraw from classes due to cancellation and were refused credit 
are still being used to claim apportionment. I feel like this must be repeated. Students who are forced out of class and denied credit are being used to fund institutions. These institutions should not be receiving apportionment if such credit is not given, unless we wanna highlight our students as empty vessels of which cash flows through. And I know that the vision for success in the student-centered funding formula were created to avoid this very scenario. I fear that this is happening elsewhere. And I know that uh, to the credit of Monterey Peninsula College that they've addressed this issue in working with the uh, chancellor's office. But I have a, a steep fear that this issue is happening elsewhere and it is extremely urgent um, that uh, a memo as requested be put out. So again, through the chair, um, Mr. President Epstein, I would also like to request a brief report for the board when this guidance memo hits the field. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's an extremely important issue and I would uh, ask the chancellor to, uh, to follow through on uh, what member Fitzgerald just asked. Well, a, a comment for President Epstein. This is an issue, certainly first we need to get clarification from what exactly is happening in the field before we put out a guidance memo. This is an issue of, uh, that relates to academic and professional matters, so where we will consult with the statewide academic senate um, in particular, um, and uh, be able to report back to, to the board, uh, if not by September, May, and certainly before then, uh, once we have some idea of uh, what exactly is happening and what kind of guidance uh, is needed, uh, if any, or if this is something that the statewide academic senate should um, take charge of. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Oakley. Other board member comments? I'll, I'll pipe in. Um, one, I just want to say that I thoroughly enjoyed the classified employee presentations today. <clears throat> we couldn't have a better master of ceremonies than Bill Rawlings for, for this category of employees. And it's just, I think it's good for all of us to put faces to the, to the people who are doing the critical work on the campuses. We just think, or maybe I just think campuses kind of run, but they don't. It takes real people doing serious work every single day. And it was just nice to see how humbled the recipients were by by honoring them. So that was, we definitely need to do that at least once a year. Um, second, I'm a little bummed out for, because I think our September meeting was supposed to be held at the Napa Community College. And I think Darius had mentioned at one point he was gonna host a little get together. So we unfortunately are not gonna be able to do that, but let's, um, let's not cancel that meeting at Darius's. We'll just delay it for some period of time. So. That's all I have. Kev, Kev, I'm still offering it up and I'm willing and able to go ahead and do it at any time. So um, I was disappointed also. And I do hope, I don't know if the chancellor is going to go ahead and roll that over to a future point, but I was looking forward to both hosting and touring Napa Community College. Beautiful. Thank you. Any other board member reports? I'll go. Um, so first and foremost, uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you all for being here. Um, as you know, with COVID-19, our student veterans and dependents who are using GI Bill benefits and other education benefits have been uh, greatly impacted. Um, I've been fortunate enough to be able to participate in uh, Region 8 meetings down in the Orange County area with uh, Terrence um, Nelson and Colin Williams from uh, Irvine Valley College. Uh, and several uh, community college and university representatives in the area. Um, they are keeping an eye on everything that has been going on with COVID-19 and potential impacts to our student veteran and dependent population. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, had no changes been implemented uh, to the legislation that was introduced earlier this year, uh, our veterans and dependents using the full uh, GI Bill benefit uh, may have lost over $2,000 in benefits, monthly benefits on their stipend. Um, so thankfully, you know, a, a group of individuals, not just from Orange County, obviously, but throughout the state, you know, have been following the events and what's going on. So uh, we're staying on top of it to see what's going to happen this upcoming semester. 
uh, the legislation will protect our student stipends all the way through December 21st. Uh, however, you all, you, know, you all know that uh, COVID has been um, getting worse in certain areas. So we honestly don't know what's gonna happen. Uh, you know, things may change for the worst uh, later this year and that may uh, prompt a lot of our colleges to remain online next semester. Uh, which will definitely uh, require new legislation or an amendment to the current legislation to extend uh, the protections that were introduced earlier this year. Uh, so that's something that I'm working on right now. Um, and I just wanna thank everybody out there uh, who has been involved in uh, helping with this process, making sure that our veterans and dependents are, are taken care of throughout this uh, situation. Thank, thank you. you. Anyone else? Uh, President Epstein, excuse me. By the way, I still know where you live um, <laughs> and I have a long memory. Uh, <laughs> in my work life, um, we've been working to address some of the immediate needs of former foster youth. So um, please come to me if you know of any in the community college system, those of you are working there that have um, immediate needs that, be, that may need to be addressed. We'd be happy to try and help. And I also want to thank um, the Chancellor's Office for uh, letting us know about Black Minds Matter. Uh, I listened to it last week and it was important and compelling and thought provoking. So if you have not had a chance to listen to last, week, last week's session, please do. And there's another one coming on Thursday. Um, so thank you for alerting us to that resource because I think it's, it's meaningful and impactful. Thank you. Oh. Anyone else? Tom, this is Alma. I want to thank uh, the Chancellor's Office for its continued engagement on the CARES Act, uh, making sure that the system uh, gets what it needs and deserves. As a result, uh, it would be great if in a future meeting, maybe not right away, um, have a better understanding of how the colleges were able to um, get those resources out. And of course, that we're continuing to serve our most underserved students like our DACA students uh, who were arbitrarily dismissed uh, in the initial uh, CARES Act implementation. So uh, thank you for their ongoing work and we hope that it yields uh, tremendous fruition for our students. Thank you. So this is Pam. Um, just a couple of things. One, I too want to um, welcome Dolores um, and Jenny. Um, we're looking forward to um, a continued collaboration um, with the, the Academic Senate. Um, I also want to call out um, uh, the work that the Chancellor's Office um, line staff have been doing um, under the direction of Daisy Gonzalez. Um, as well as the executive staff. I, I guess um, sometimes things can um, seem so effortlessly, especially when they, we don't know about any bumps in the road. Um, and, uh, and since I don't know any bumps in the road, all I can see is that things are getting done, things are happening, and that's in no small part to the exemplary um, staff in the chancellor's office, as well as the executive staff. And I, I wanna add that um, thank you to the foundation who have um, uh, pulled out stops to make certain that um, there is funding for those students who are in most need. Um, it's really critically important and it's nice to see that uh, uh, that the chancellor's office and the foundation um, have not uh, missed a beat. And if they've had, then they've run to catch up. And so it's, I want them to know that it's greatly appreciated by us. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, is that a wrap? Okay, I guess, um, I can't recall if we've asked for public comment on board reports, but I, I guess it can't hurt to do so. Um, are there any uh, public comments? Yes, President Epstein, I've been, uh, I've been told that there is no period for public comment okay. on and I have not received any through the Q&A. Okay, that's good. So um, 
We're now moving down to, uh, we, we already obviously did the closed session. We're moving to public forum, item 7.1. Are there any people uh, seeking to speak during the public forum? Yes, Board President Epstein, we have received public comments for public forum, and we will begin with Academic Senate President Dolores Davison. Good morning, Chancellor Oakley, Board President Epstein, Vice President Haynes, and members of the Board of Governors. Uh, my name is Dolores Davison. I am the president of the Academic Senate for California Community Colleges. As most of you are aware, the ASCCC represents the 62,000 faculty in the state in academics and professional matters as codified by the Board of Governors standing orders as well as statute. I'm deeply appreciative of the welcomes by Chancellor Oakley, by Vice President Haynes, and by Board Member Perigo, and for the opportunity to address you during public comment. Um, for the last two years, the Academic Senate has adopted at our opening meetings goals, which have included things such as faculty diversification, guided pathways, and the completion of strong workforce task force recommendations. Some of these were seen as long-term, five to 10-year goals. Others, such as the re-examination of minimum qualifications for CTE, uh, were completed after a year or two. Uh, this year, at our first executive committee meeting of the 2020-2021 year, uh, on June 17th, the newly elected executive committee agreed that instead this year we would devote ourselves to areas of focus. And we chose this change in wording because we recognize that goals tend to be finite, while areas of focus are more likely to be consistent with our practices and actions for many years to come. Uh, those three areas which were agreed upon by the executive committee are guided pathways, implementation, and integration. Uh, culturally responsive student services, student support, and curriculum practices, and equity-driven systems. Um, each of these areas of focus has numerous subheadings and there is tremendous overlap, but the ASCCC remains committed to the work of equity, diversity, inclusion, and anti-racism. This year's executive committee is the most diverse in our history with 60% of the executive committee identifying as people of color. In addition, for the first time in our history, all five of our officers are female and the board itself is 73% female. We seek to be a model for local academic senates, both in the state and throughout the country. And we are delighted to be doing this extraordinarily important work at such a crucial time in partnership with the chancellor's office, all of our system stakeholders, and with you, the board of governors. Thank you for your time. And I look forward to our continued collaboration going forward. Sounds great, thank you. Thank you. Um, the board has received letters addressing the Peralta matter, which are intended to be made public, distributed to the board, and will be posted on the board's internet page for public viewing. I will read aloud the names of those who have submitted public comments on this matter. Anita Black, Julina Bonilla, Meredith Brown, Donald Moore, William Trago, Jennifer Briefa, Andrea Malarkey, Jennifer Shanoski, Thomas Renbarger, Linda Handy, Kimberly King, Richard Goel, Adam Bolo, Alicia Caballero Christensen, Chris Wittenbach, and that's it. So did they each uh, send a separate letter or um or have they uh, signed on to, to a handful of letters? How, did, how does that work? Similar in content, but a little different. Okay, and they will be um, made publicly available and sent directly to the, each member of the board? Correct. Okay, thank you. There's, there's no specific three minute comment that we have, we've received though. No. Okay. Um, is there any, anyone else wishing to speak during the public forum? I have not received any comments through the Q&A feature at this time. Was that Epstein? May I just ask you a clarifying question? Sure. Um, the uh, substantial amount of public comments, uh, it was mentioned that they were kind of all around the same topic. I think I missed so. What, I just am curious about what that topic was. It was the Peralta College District situation. Oh, okay. All right, thank you. Um, okay, uh, no other public forum comments. Uh, 
We now go on to uh, item 8.1, new business. Does anyone have anything they want to propose for new business? Any public uh, comments on this item? No. Okay. Well, excellent meeting everyone. Thanks uh, to the staff for putting this together uh, quite seamlessly and to all the board members. We had 100% participation. And uh, I wish we could see each other in person, but uh, we'll continue to soldier on and uh, do the best we can. Thank you all.